Hi everybody, it's Chris, and welcome to another video by the Infinity System. Uh, today's episode is part two of our series, Denying DID. The first part, a part of the condition we just released two days ago, you guys have been commenting on it. This was raw video, uh, taken in 19... Uh, let's see, I'm sorry, 2019, yeah. <laughs> Off to a raring start here. Um... And the reason that we put this out was because it's the easiest way to show you what DID uh, and denying it looks like. This was, was the, that footage was very early on. Uh, we had just not quite been diagnosed, but our therapist had let us know uh, that she suspected that we had DID, and I think she was just kind of trying to prepare us uh, for that fact before the tests, and we had just had started to have all the trauma coming out uh, that happened to Christopher, and he was remembering it, we were remembering it, and the flashbacks and the body memories had begun. Um, it was nasty, and we had recorded those videos uh, at night when we would just, at the end of the day, after we were done with everything and it was just us, just us left to ourselves in the house. We'd soak in the tub and try to relax and just, uh, for what reason we don't know, we decided to record, our, or I decided to record our thoughts. Um, <laughs> don't know why. Uh, but now we're kind of glad that we did uh, because it shows not only where we were, but where we've come. And that's one of the the things that we want to fill you in on before we go any farther into the episode, because a great number of you have expressed concern about Christopher, who is our littlest and is the one that we were directly referring to in the video. Um, he's all right now. He expressed much of his trauma. Uh, not all of it, but he's expressed enough of it to where he's uh, he feels safe uh, in the glade with Ariolana. That's where he lives, I guess you could say. Um, she let him in. It's a very protected, safe space within the head space where it's just basically, it's a bubble, you know, nothing goes in that she allows and she keeps it very safe. Um, this is actually kind of a bone of contention among some of our alters right now, but that's on another sidetrack. So, uh, he's doing a lot better. Um, he, the, our therapist was able to work with him last uh, Christmas. He fronted for the better part of the day, which was the first Christmas that he had had since 1974. And uh, we deserved a Christmas, and we had a good Christmas. Um, so he colors, and he plays with Legos, and uh, he talks, although his speech is uh, delayed because of the trauma. Um, but he is much, much happier in a much happier space than he was, uh, as you can see by this photo uh, here or here. We're not sure exactly where we'll put it, wherever we have much room. Um, but uh, this is a picture that he drew uh, for our therapist, um, and uh, it kind of shows you where he's at right now. So he's a lot better. Thank you guys for, you know, for asking and for worrying about him um, and about us. It was very much a struggle at first, but there was... One thing that our therapist told us, and it's stuck in our brains, uh, because every once in a while somebody will tell you something that is the truth, true in capital letters, and it strikes you, and you know it. And this is one of those instances, and we were talking about the denial, and she told us, just looked at us from across the room, and very calmly said, trauma doesn't lie. Three simple words, trauma doesn't lie. And it was as though a bomb had exploded in our heads um, because Data had <sighs> been doing his best to, under, to un uncover any stone or any shred of evidence uh, anything that he could find that might prove that, yes, this actually happened to us, that we were being abused during this space of these spans of time that we don't remember. Um, and, and he looked back at genealogical record. Uh, at, I mean, he, he traced it back, went through all the family photo albums, took them and assembled them. 
uh, well, what he could find. Uh, that's a, another story altogether. But it was as though he was trying to weigh the evidence to find out, yes, uh, is this real? Can we depend on this? And eventually he did find enough evidence to do it, but those three words, trauma doesn't lie, took us all aback. Because it's the truth. DID, and for the course of this video, we are going to be dealing specifically with traumagenic systems, those who are caused by trauma. Uh, it doesn't have to be sexual or physical abuse in nature, environmental, being caught in a war zone for a long period of time, deprivation of basic human needs. So it doesn't have to be sexual, it doesn't have to be physical, it doesn't have to be emotional abuse, but it often is. And so for the purpose of this video, we will be dealing with those type of systems. So, trauma doesn't lie. Um, how do we know this? Uh, unless there is evidence of a situational trauma, war, disaster, deprivation of needs, emotional abuse, most DID is caused by sexual or physical trauma. Uh, these two are the same. Sexual abuse and physical abuse are the same thing. Uh, don't, don't think that just because you were sexually abused doesn't mean that you weren't physically abused as well. Um, because uh, sexual abuse is physical abuse as well. It's just an added layer of yuck on top of it. Uh, and before we go any farther, as with our other heavier videos, uh, trigger warning, uh, we will be putting them up uh, as needed. This episode should be fairly trigger-free. We're going to do our best, but at the same time, as with all of these episodes, consider this an overall trigger warning. Okay, so away we go. Physical abuse, sexual abuse, they're the same thing. Uh, what this does is this, conf this forces us to confront the fact that we were abused by those who were supposed to have protected us, or that we believed protected us. Uh, this often includes immediate family or friends, or relatives, uh, parents. Uh, victims with DID do not remember the trauma until later when the brain or the subconscious unlocks the memory that has been recorded of the trauma because it's judged that you're now capable of dealing with that experience and working through it. Um, how exactly it decides this pff, beats the hell out of me. Uh, we haven't ran across that one yet. Um, if we run across any research on that, we'll tell you what we find out. Um, but as a result, uh, when we find out that we may have DID or we're diagnosed with it, we are confused because we may not honestly remember the abuse being that bad or even believe that it occurred at all, that we did grow up in an abusive household, uh, that, that, you know, we, we, that didn't happen to us. We didn't grow up in an abusive household. These, these kind of things are normal. It happens to every, you know, kid and, and, and every household. You tend to minimize, minimize it, and this is deliberate both on the part of your abusers, uh, because they will often... It's, 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 it's deliberate on the part of the abusers, and it's also, uh, it's, other, it's also another manifestation of the guilt-blame-shame cycle, because what will happen is the abusers will foster this separation and this lack of outside perspective uh, to further the cycle of abuse and control, and to foster that guilt-blame-shame cycle. The child who is in the situation and doesn't know anything other than the abuse uh, will consider it normal. They will not realize or believe that they're being abused. It is normal to them, particularly in the case of DID, where the trauma memories have been locked away and that amnesic barrier has went up when the emotional part has been split off. When your brain has encapsulated that emotional part, that trauma memory, and that altar off. Because we can't deal with this right now. We're not at a point where we're safe to deal with this, so locked away. There's an altar. Here's another experience. Lock that one away. So it's normal to you. You, you have no outside perspective. And worse, 
abusers will often put on a public mask of the bright, shiny, happy family whenever you're out in public or going to church or uh, a, an event or something like that. This leads to a confusing dichotomy where there are two representations of the family, two parts that are not reconcilable. You have the public face of, oh, I love you, we're a happy family, come here, buddy, let me give you an Indian rug burn on the head, or give you a big hug or a kiss, and then you've got the other side, where you are with an emotionally, physically, sexually abusive person, and you can't get away from them. And so you're expected to act one way when you're out in public, and another way when you're back at home, in that controlled environment. And particularly for a child, and particularly when you've just split, you may not be able to tell which one you're supposed to do. And they'll let you know. They'll let you know which one. Because you'll get punished for it. Or did. So this dichotomy just, just further serves to further the disbelief. And as a result of all this control and manipulation, and not having an outside perspective to view your life from, it's difficult to accept that the abuse happened. That the terrible things that your brain is remembering are not just revenge fantasies caused by subconsciously wanting to lash out at your parents because you think that you had a shitty childhood. Uh, it's more than that. But because DID is a hidden disorder, by its very nature, even and especially from the victims, from the survivors of it, from the people with the condition, it makes that eventual revelation of the fact that you are a multiple all the more shocking. You're going, this couldn't have happened. I'm, 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 I'm just making this, this all up. These, 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 these people couldn't have possibly done these things to me. I mean, you know, it's like Uncle Joe. He, he was a little creepy, you know, but I, I mean, I, I just, you know, or I, I don't remember any of this, you know, it's, it's I, I mean, I may not remember much, but I know that this didn't happen. Uh, you know, I, I, I would remember this. Uh, you know, not remembering your childhood is normal. Uh, and nobody remembers all that stuff. It just, it just, you know, goes blank or goes away. It's not that important. And you're left with these big blank holes in your life. I mean, nobody can remember that stuff in your childhood, right? There's no way that this possibly could have happened to me. You know, there would have been signs, right? <sighs> there are signs. There are clear signs. And denial of the condition is part of the condition, and you will fight against it, especially in the beginning. You will refuse to believe that you have DID, despite the professionals telling you that you do, that you might, or that you do. Uh, why? Because you don't want to. It's, it's easier not to be this way. We want to be normal. We don't want to be like this. We're trapped in a hell from which we can't escape. One which we can only minimize the symptoms of and try to live our best life. DID does not go away. It just does not magically disappear. This is a lifelong condition that is caused by intense trauma before the ages of 9 to 10. If you're past the age of then when the brain, when the ego states congeal, I'm sorry, you don't have DID. You may have OSDD, BPD, or one of the other structural dissociative or disorders. But no, those folks are running around saying, oh, you no, know, you can have DID without trauma. It's in the DISM-5. Uh, no. No, it's not. And you don't understand how DID is formed and what it's all about if you're running around saying that uh, you can have DID with no trauma. There's trauma. It may be, like we've said, war, environmental, emotional, uh, but it has to be repeated, severe trauma over the course of time. This is not a comfy, cozy little condition that one can catch like the flu. 
Okay, it's hardcore. And anybody selling that is full of shit. Period. The science is there. The research is there. Go look. Educate yourself before you open your mouth and spread misinformation on something that you don't understand. Educate yourself. And to make it worse, there's the media. Spreading fear and misinformation all over the movies. Split. For example, the United States of Terra, uh, several others. All of the crap going around right now. The accusations of fakery. Okay, let's deal with that. You cannot fake DID. Not really. Sooner or later you will get tripped up. You may be able to convince yourself that, yeah, you've got it, that you all these different things, but unless you get your butt in there and get diagnosed, unless you have the trauma, unless you're willing to find out, you can't say anything for sure. And you have absolutely no right to assume that anybody else's claim of DID is fake. You can't judge that. You're not in their head. You haven't experienced their trauma if they have trauma. They may not be diagnosed yet. They may be struggling with it. They may be fighting with it themselves. Of all of the people out there, Systems have the hardest time believing this. We don't need you to add fuel to the fire. Get in there and get diagnosed. And if you've got DID, well then, welcome to the worst club in the fucking world. But don't pretend to be something that you're not unless you're willing to do the legwork and find out and do the education to find out whether or not you really are a system. And we're probably pissing a few people off by saying this, but it's time to weigh in. There's a lot of misinformation going around out there, and it doesn't matter whether you think a system is fake or not. It doesn't matter how outrageous it may seem. You don't have that right to judge. That's why there are professionals Got it? Hope so. So how do you deal with this denial when you think that you might be faking? <laughs> it's, it's, you don't have to tell us. <laughs> how do we deal with it, with the denial, when we think every damn day that we might be faking, when we ourselves are not certain when we don't even remember what it is that we're not supposed to remember. When it would be easier not to believe in this. Not to believe that you were horrendously abused as a child. When you very much want to pretend that it's not real and that it will just all go away and things will go back to the nice comfortable rut that you've become accustomed to living in. Because it's safer and it's easier. How do you resist that impulse? How do you break that chain of disbelief? With evidence. With evidence. With facts. By looking at the trauma and the effects that it has had and is having on you. Right now. If you're a system as you're watching this video. These are the symptoms that professionals, that therapists look for. These are the telltale signs of abuse, of trauma. And to the trained eye, that person with the outside perspective, it is as though you are screaming it out loud at the top of your voice. And it all boils down to this. Trauma doesn't lie. So what are these symptoms? What are the things that are screaming out to your therapist, to the professionals whose job it is to pick up on these things and help you? The symptoms are common and they vary. The severity 
of symptoms varies. It, it is associated with an onset at an early age, extended or frequent abuse, incest by a parent, the use of brutal force. These are all the causes. What may trigger them are common life stressor events, may trigger the return of symptoms for CSA survivors and set them off without even knowing it. A death, a birth, a marriage, a divorce, moving from some place that you have lived for a long time. Uh, systems are very tied to physical stability, one place, and order. They like things just neat and so. These are all major life stressors. And we suspect that it was probably the death of our first wife that started the cascade uh, effect that caused our system to break down. I'm sure we were already under tremendous pressure, but I think at that point, we're not sure, but it's likely it was at that point that we just, I know we lost time after. And yeah, so that that's <laughs> perfect example right there. Perfect example right there, because it was several years after that that we began showing symptoms. So what are the symptoms? We've talked about them, but we have we danced around them. What exactly do they look for? The primary after effects of childhood sexual abuse. These are the things that the professionals look for include emotional disturbances, um, inability to regulate emotions, wild swings, fear, anxiety, intense fear, intense anxiety, uh, shame, humiliation, guilt, self-blame, depression, uh, again, anxiety. These are caused by one of the most commonly diagnosed things for a trauma victim, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, a primary structural dissociation. One EP, one AMP. If you're not familiar with those terms, hit up our video, Who in the Hell Are You People?, where we go over the theory of structural dissociation and how alters form and what an ANP and an EP is. Uh, Post-traumatic stress disorder can be, it's, it's the first level. It can be experienced by anyone who, is a, who has suffered an intense trauma. You will often have, sufferers will often have intrusive or recurring thoughts. They cannot get certain images or thoughts out of their heads. They will have nightmares. Uh, they will have night terrors. They will have what is called sleep paralysis, where your brain is caught in between being awake and falling asleep in that weird in-between part, and you cannot move. You are aware. You may experience dark figures and forms and an intense feeling of dread uh, or danger, absolute terror. Um, Sufferers will often have a distorted self-perception. Often with CSA and sexual assault, the survivors will develop a belief that they caused the sexual assault somehow, that they caused the sexual abuse and they deserved it. Uh, we've covered this in depth just recently uh, in our Learning to Love Again, Sex, Trauma, and DID. I know that we're referencing a lot of other episodes, but this all ties together. We are presenting them in a certain order for a reason. So please, check them out. But these are just the disturbance effects. There are also another... Uh, there are also a number of physical effects that go along with it. Stress headaches. Uh, chronic and diffuse, which means non-specific. You can't quite identify where uh, it's coming from. Pains in your pelvic or your abdominal region. Uh, again, anxiety, overwhelming anxiety, depression, self-neglect. 
Not brushing your teeth. Not cleaning your clothes. Not washing the sheets. Not taking a bath. Uh, Self-neglect. Not going. Not making dental appointments. Not follow, making or following through on medical appointments. Uh, we're bad on that one. Mea culpa. We do a lot of self-neglect. And we're trying to be better about it. Um, eating disorders. That's, that's another one. Very, very common. Very common with trauma and abuse survivors. But that's not all. You got the mental effects. You got the physical effects. <laughs> How about the sexual effects? Again, we just covered these, but lack of desire. Inability to become aroused. The inability to orgasm. Uh, these are caused by the trauma bonding and the indigenous opioids, which we again covered in our Learning to Love Again video. So please go and check that out because we do go much more into depths of these things that we're brushing over here. There is a high percentage of risky behaviors. Uh, early or unintended pregnancies are often associated with sexual abuse. Suddenly developing an STD, a sexually transmitted disease as a child with no particular cause. Hmm, wonder where that came from. So in addition to the psychological, the physical, and the sexual effects, these all cascade into relationship and interpersonal effects. Uh, there may be identity confusion. Who am I? Changing. Changing yourself to fit in with others. How many of you have been a chameleon throughout your entire life just to go with the flow and fit in with others? Find yourself that nice, comfortable little niche in a group where you can be there but not be there. Or change your beliefs, suddenly go from one religion to the next. One sexuality to the next. Changing yourself to fit in with others around you is very common with abuse survivors, particularly chronic abuse survivors, because it helps to, uh, your brain is still looking to minimize the abuse. It's a carryover of that emotional part that is created to minimize the abuse by accepting it and seeking to uh, control the surroundings to where it won't be as bad. All of this makes you more apt to being victimized by others. Again, due to the trauma bonding and the conditioning from the previous assault, from the previous abusers. Uh, this makes us very subjective to exploitation by manipulative or untrustworthy people. These are just some of the signs and the symptoms that the professionals, that therapists look for. Even though we don't see them even though we may want to deny them. They are there. They are the fingerprint, the trace, the ghost of the incident that the brain has encoded and locked away. Like a recording of a recording. Those physical effects don't go away as the trauma bonds to the brain on the neurochemical level, it institutes a series of physical changes. PTSD, anxiety, depression, sleeping disorders, tiredness, and on and on and on. These are physical effects, physical symptoms that are coming out, mental symptoms that are coming out, relationship problems that are coming out because there is something there under the surface and you can't see it. You might have sensed it. It's like in the Matrix. You might have sensed that there's something wrong with the universe, like a thorn in your side and you've never been able to pull it out. This is why. Because there is something under the surface, but you can't see it. Your therapist can't. The professionals can. And when they tell you, when they diagnose you, you will not believe it. You will fight it. 
with every fiber of your being. Those AMPs are going to still try to deny because they can't deal with the trauma. That's why they are AMPs, apparently normal parts. They don't contain the trauma. The EPs do. And we must avoid the EPs. Therefore, we must avoid the truth that we were abused over a very long period of time in a very intense manner. No one wants to believe that. Much less when your own brain is telling you that it didn't happen until it suddenly tells you that it did. And the one thing out of this entire video, as strange as this may seem, that we clung to in all of this storm of tumult, of self-doubt, of denial, of the very same thing that you saw in the previous video, that denial, that not wanting to believe, that self-doubt, that fear of everything around us, can be countered by three simple words. Trauma doesn't lie. Your trauma can't lie to you. Trauma doesn't lie. And there are several other words that you should remember. And we're going to leave you with those. You are not to blame. Trauma doesn't lie. And you are not to blame. That's all for this time, guys. We know it was another one of our heavier-ish episodes, uh, but these are the things that need to be talked about. They need to be aired out in order to help us all. And if by sharing our point of view and what we've discovered in our experiences, and we know they're kind of gut-wrenching at times, but we need to show you what it's really like. Um, so please kind of forgive us for that. Uh, but we feel very strongly that we need to do this, and you guys have been very supportive of that, so we're going to keep right on trucking and keep peeling off the Band-Aid on these hard issues, and we thank you for supporting us in doing that. And we'd like to remind you, as always, to remember that you are loved, that you are strong, and that you are not alone. I'm Chris. Thanks for watching.